Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Albion Fans Forum, coming to you live from the Amex after last year's virtual experience. Uh, it's great to have some of you here uh, in the uh, Mayo Wim Baxter Lounge. Um, we all a little bit socially distanced, but that's good to see. But we're live on BBC Radio Sussex. Thanks for coming along. Um, we will get on to some questions a little bit later on that have been sent to us. Um, we'll try and get around those. But if anyone here wants to ask any questions, do approach the mic. It's slightly different from uh, years gone by in the sense that uh, we don't have roving reporters with microphones uh, in these current times. But uh, just come up, uh, ask your question, just say who you are, where you're from, and who's your question for. Uh, and of course, uh, go from there. Please don't touch the mic uh, as well. Entering stage left, just like boxers coming into the ring, your panel for this evening. Let's have a big warm reception for <laughs> Chairman and owner Tony Blue, Chief Executive Paul Barber, and the Seagulls head coach, Graham Potter. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, gents. Right on cue, perfect timing. And, um, a very good evening. We'll get on to the questions just uh, in a short while. We've already mentioned that. Um, we've got loads that have been submitted on various different subjects. Um, I just wonder whether first up though, Tony, because we haven't been, as it were, in a room together for a while. It's been in, uh, an interesting 18 months or so. I just wonder whether you had just a few words just to say to the fans and maybe a message for everything that's happened over the last couple of years. Uh, thanks, Johnny, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, as I reflect on the last uh, 18 months, it's, it's been, yeah, for everyone, you know, uh, everyone from a football club point of view, it's been a, such a tough time. And I really wanna uh, say how everyone at Brighton has done, both within the, the, the situations and with the difficulty operationally, um, running a football club at the stadium and the bubbles at the training ground. So huge credit to everyone, and particularly Graham and the players for just, being very, very professional through it all, and, uh, and, and the fans for being patient, and uh, I'm just so glad that uh, this season we're gonna see 30,000 every week at the Amex, all being well, and um, we've gotta look forward. Unfortunately, COVID's here to stay. We've still gotta manage situations. It's very difficult for our operational team to have that amount of people with the COVID uh, rules and, and keeping the players and the staff safe and, and keeping everyone in the community safe. So. Um, and also, I just want to use this opportunity to, uh, to say thank you for the NHS and all the people in the community who have done so much for, for the people in the city. Thank you, Tony. Graham, did you just want to say a few words? I mean, I guess having fans back in the Amex is, is very special because we're in, we've been in uncharted territory, haven't we? Yeah, we have, absolutely. Uh, it's wonderful to have them back. Um, it's, been, it's amazing what you get used to. You get used to them not being here because mm. you have to. You have to adapt. But um, there's no there's no better feeling than a than a crowd and that feeling when you score and you win and you celebrate in front of your own people. It's 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 amazing. Well, guys, the mic is yours. This is your evening. So if you've got a question that you want to fire away, let's hope the first one's a good one. That gentleman, you're brave gentleman. Well done. Well done you for getting up there and uh, asking your first question. But do say who you are, where you're from, and who's your question for. Uh, hi, I'm Tony Parker from Lewis and the North Stand. I've got a habit of asking the first question at these events. Uh, now, this, this is for Graham again. Um, I, for one, am amongst the vast majority of fans in thinking that with Tony Bloom, Paul Barber, Graham Potter and the rest of the team, our club is magnificently managed and I appreciate everything that you do. I think, personally, I think you make every decision correctly. Now, I don't know anything about yeah. this. Is there a butt coming can, 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 we, can we get that repeated again, please? <laughs> There's definitely a yes. butt coming, isn't there? Obviously, I don't know uh, nearly as much as you about football. Um, but uh, you, you manage the, the squad flexibly. Uh, you like your players to uh, perform a number of roles. Uh, in which case, maybe Shane Duffy up front one, one time. <laughs> don't rule it out. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you've managed the squad perfectly as far as I'm concerned. But there are some uh, fans who believe that we should have signed a, an established striker this summer. Uh, what can you say, please, to set their minds at rest that we're following the perfect path and we're doing everything that we can, uh, given the constraints on the... Uh, on, the, on the club and COVID and so on. 
Thank, Thank you, you Dribble. Well done. And I think it reflects quite a few emails that have come into us as well on the subject of striking options. It's probably multifaceted, but Graham, do you want to start off on this one? Yeah, I, I, well, firstly, thank you for your, your uh, question. And um, believe you me, I don't m make every decision correctly. That's uh, the whole point of the process of coaching is you, you try your best, you, you make a decision, you get it right or wrong, you analyse it and you try and improve. And um, that's certainly something I've done all my career and it's something I'm going to continue to do. In regards to the, <clears throat> the specific position striker, I think we're all at the same whatever our position is, whatever our opinion is, we all want to improve. We all want the team to get better. We all want to win football matches. Um, fans want to win because they love the club and I want to win because I love my job and I want to win and my life gets better if I win football matches at the weekend. I, I can play my kids nicely and I can, my, my wife's a bit more, you know, she has a happier life because I'm happy. So we're sort of the same. Um, we just have a responsibility in terms of how does the team improve? And, um, and, from my perspective, you can look at it in a few ways. You can analyse the team performance and say, um, we did a lot well and we've done a lot well. And, um, and if we can maintain that performance and try and improve that performance, the margins that have probably didn't really go in our favours so much last year can go in our favour. And therefore, you're looking at an increased uh, points, you're looking at an increased position in the table. So that's the first thing. Um, and, and then you also look at, okay, um, what does the contribution of the players that we already have, what, what, what do they do? Can they improve? Because I think as a football club, it's really important that we, that we can get the most out of the guys we have and not always look for external solutions all the time because it feels like the right thing to do is an easy, you know, to sign somebody from outside and it'll fix all our problems. The reality is not quite as simple as that because a guarantee of however many goals you want, A, it's not so easy to find, and it doesn't necessarily lead to an improvement in the team. I know that's a bit of a strange thing to say, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee an improvement in the team. And the most important thing is the team improves. What you want to do is try and say, okay, we performed well last year, and I'm sure if I had Neil Malpai sat here, and I had Danny Welbeck sat here, and I had Leo Trossard sat here, and all the other guys, they would say that they think they can improve. They think they can get better. They think there's more to come from them. And I think when you've got people like that, that are desperate to do well, desperate to play better, desperate to learn, desperate to improve, then I think it's, uh, I've got a responsibility as well to, to do that, to help them. But always you've got to look for how to improve because clearly if we could maintain the level that we had, but just somebody better that fits in our structure that can help us improve the scoring phase of our game, then yes, we would try and sign that person. But there's not, there's not a cue of them out, outside the door as well. So there's a bit of a balance between uh, yeah, I could, do the right, I could do the right thing by me. The easy thing would be just to sign a striker uh, to keep you guys off my back, the guys that you're referring to. But it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be any better as a team or a club. And the most important thing is, is that. Um, and I'm really confident in the guys we've got that can improve. And um, as always in every transfer window, we'll always look to try to improve the squad. And that will continue to happen. Graham, obviously the, the club did sign some strikers. Um, I've got one here from Chris in Worthing on a sort of similar theme. He says he can't quite get his head around selling Tao and loaning out Andoni and Zakiri without bringing in striking options, whilst they have brought in Seema, uh, who had a breakthrough season at Slavia Prague, an impressive one, including Europa League football. Why wasn't he considered ready for the Premier League? Well, these are all d decisions that you take as a club and as a squad and as a coach and a... Uh, yeah, sometimes people agree and sometimes they don't. Um, I think you've got to look at the balance of your squad. You've got to look at how many players are for, for each position. You've got to look at if you sign more strikers, it means that maybe some more attacking midfield players doesn't play. Uh, how, does that, how does the overall team function? Um, and also you've got the individuals themselves saying, well, actually, I want to play football more regularly. Uh, I'm not happy here, for example. There can be that type of conversations as well, which you have to bear in mind. I'm not saying anybody was that, got to that point, but players also want to play. So it's that balance between um, being a squad player, uh, whether they can influence the first team, uh, or whether they, it's better for them and for us to, the, to them to find another, another career path. Tony, I don't know, did you want to add anything on the, the situation, or the striking situation? Probably not, but no, go on. Go on. <laughs> well, I think Graham answered it really well. Um, the way we recruit 
in the squad. We try and improve year on year, both in terms of a process and, term, and, and also in terms of our squad of players. So there's a team uh, with, with Dan and, and, and Paul Winstanley and Carl McCauley, you know, working you know, all year round on um, improving the squad. And it's not just about getting a player in, it's part of a much wider thing of fitting into the team and the environment. And, and yes, one could look at some strikers who score lots of goals, but that doesn't mean they will for Brighton. And it could mean, it doesn't necessarily mean even they do score goals, that we will win more games and gain more points. It's, it's, it's much more complicated than that. And, and at the end of the day, it's, it's a decision made between many of us. And uh, we're extremely happy with the squad we've got. Uh, we're delighted with the start we've made and uh, really looking forward to the rest of the season. Does anyone else want to come? Yeah, just help you to come up and then if you want to queue, you can queue, but just pop up and ask your question. Uh, good evening. Uh, Eddie from Brighton. I sit over in the East Lower. Um, some of the football that we saw last year was absolutely superb and it's, it's the rub of the ball sometimes. It goes for us, it doesn't go for us. Um, I think our best signing this year, without doubt, is keeping Pesuma. I just think that's a, a fantastic bit of um, business. Lamptey, hopefully we'll get to see him soon again. And obviously Big Bobby playing for Spain as well. You know, we're going to have another big club knocking on the door saying we want some money. Um, I've got a question for Paul, if I may. Um, the operational issue around the Everton game, and thank you for your email exploring it. Can you just shed a bit more light on, you know, I know the, the supply that we had to get us in. I was outside the East Stand at quarter past two, and I tried to get here early enough just to say, take in the atmosphere, and obviously we haven't been here for 18 months. And the guys were doing their job brilliantly, and they were looking for COVID passes, and we were looking for the lateral flow tests. And then it got to 10 to 3, and the queue was still down by the chip stand. So all of a sudden, they took away the, the COVID tests, and we, we flew in. How difficult and how frustrating is that for you? Well, um, first of all, it's very difficult to completely change the operations of a stadium that's been open a decade. You know, you're, you're asking people and staff to change behaviours in a, in, a, in a way overnight, and that's very difficult. And we have to balance, really, uh, um, the desire to get everyone in as quickly as we can and as safely as we can with what will most certainly be mandatory checks from the 1st of October. So we had a choice. We could either wait until the 1st of October and just wave everyone through, and then on the 1st of October or the 2nd of October, as it will be for us, pray that the new checks work with no preparation whatsoever, or we could take the view that we've got three home games between then and the 2nd of October to try and work out how best we're going to manage it. And the problem is, what we don't know, what we didn't know then and what we still don't know now, is whether those checks are going to be 100% or whether they're going to be random. So what we've been doing is testing in different areas of the ground at different times for different reasons, checking everyone, checking one in 10, checking one in 20, checking one in 30, seeing how long it takes, seeing what that does to the queues, seeing what pressure that puts on the staff, see what kind of reaction we get from supporters, seeing what we might need to do to make it quicker or better or easier. Um, and all of these things are being trialed at every Premier League club up and down the country as we speak. Some have done very little in the first two games and are now stepping it up, or did step it up for game three and will do this weekend for game four. Some have been trying 100% checks, some have been trying one in 10. The reality is we still haven't heard yet from the government what they want us to do, except to say that we are now 99.9% .9 certain that the checks will be mandatory from the 1st of October. And what we don't know is what the percentage will be, but what we do know is if someone is checked and doesn't meet the requirements, they won't be allowed in. Um, so it's a difficult process. And then when you add on to that, um, the, the issues we've had with staffing, um, you know, I, again, I would ask everyone to sort of take a step back and think about whether you would commit to a job that only gave you 20 days work a year, uh, or whether you, in a COVID environment where perhaps you've lost your main job, would take a job that gives you four or five days a week at a hotel or a bar or a restaurant. And a lot of our casual staff are in that situation where you know, this, this work is, is not their only work, or if it was their only work, then they obviously want it to be more than 20 days a year. And then compounding that again, the universities aren't back. 
and a lot of our, our casual labour, whether it's catering or whether it's match day staff, come from the universities. So we're at probably our worst possible period, even worse than we normally have during the summer, for doing all of these things and doing them for the first time and doing them in an environment where some of our own staff are quite fearful of COVID. And, you know, we, we've been really, really impressed with the way the vast majority of supporters have, have helped us by complying, not trying to dodge the system, being patient and helping us. As always, there's a few people that let themselves down, but, but that happens in any walk of life, in any situation. Um, but at the moment, we're preparing for the 2nd of October, mandatory checks, and it's just really a question of whether it will be everyone all of the time or some of the people all of the time. Is there any time span on that, Paul, when you might know, or is it, is it just one of those things like everything at the moment constantly changing? Um, well, I, we, had a Premier League plan, meeting, we had a Premier League meeting this afternoon, and in yeah. the, the two or three hours leading up to that, the government's position had moved a couple of times. And that's not because they don't know what they're doing. It's because they're constantly taking feedback from clubs that are feeding information on how long it's taken to get people in. And you can imagine it's difficult here with 30,000, Manchester United have got 75,000 people to get in. Those of you going to Brentford at the weekend will see that it's a much smaller capacity, but there is literally no space around their stadium to hold people while these checks are taking place. So every single club in the country has got a range of different problems, and they've all got the problems that we've got on staffing to different degrees. And it is a really challenging time. And you know, I, I feel for you, because we're asking you to be really patient, but I also feel for my staff who are having to do these checks when we all know that it's difficult enough to, to, to look after each other in a COVID environment. Thanks very much indeed. If you want to come up and ask a question, feel free. Um, you're listening to BBC Radio Sussex. You can also uh, watch it back again on my Albion TV if you missed the first uh, quarter of an hour already. We're already a quarter of an hour in, so if you want to ask a question, make sure you do. Next gentleman. Uh, good evening. My name's Paul. I'm also uh, a season ticket holder in the East Lower. My, quest my question is one subject, but it's for all three of you. The, when Dan and his team have uh, identified somebody that you're of interest, whether you're going to go in for him or not, for Paul, what's the one deciding factor that decides whether or not you're going to go ahead or not? Is it the salary of the player? Is it the transfer fee, the signing on fee? agents fees or whether the player wants to move to the area <laughs> for Graham. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Is this three questions in it's, one? It's one question but all three at the same So time. that's the question? That, the second question is for Graham but in oh. one. Oh. Through the transfers, do you, what do you do? Do you actually suggest players? Does Dan come to you and suggest players to you? And when a transfer is going through, do you have any involvement in it? And to Tony, in the past, this is three questions, isn't it? This, well, is not, this is not the same question to three people. <laughs> yeah. no, you're just doing three at the same time. Yeah, so okay. Sit down Rest your drink. legs. You can put them all three. Okay, go for and it. And for Tony, in the past, when you've been dealing with transfers, you're obviously a world-renowned um, gambler, uh, a very successful businessman, and, a, and the world's best football chairman. Have you got any stories from the past where your um, skills have actually led you to get a bargain for the Albion? Well, let's give Tony a little bit of time to come up with his stories. <laughs> let's start with Paul. Okay. Um, well, I mean, first... What is the overriding factors when you're making a decision on a, on a transfer? <laughs> well, first of all, the, yeah, the, the, the recruitment process doesn't start and end in the, tra in the transfer windows. You know, it's an it's a all-year-round process, and there are scouts working in lots of different places in the world to identify targets that, for positions that, that Graham and Dan and, and Tony have identified. And once those positions are identified, we're then looking at those players, compiling reports, looking at data, looking at a whole range of different things. And then we'll start to then get more information on whether that player is likely to be available, whether we can afford him, whether his wages are going to be within our range, whether the agent has got any appetite to help us bring the player to this club or whether there's a, a different agenda there. But ultimately, it, it starts and ends with, with what Graham needs. There's no point in bringing in players that Graham doesn't need or doesn't want. Equally, you know, we have to find players that fit the budget. We have to make sure that, that, that Tony is comfortable with, you know, what our expenditure is at any given time, what our, our, our budgets are, what our salary structures are. So there are many, many different factors that go in. And, and as I've said here many times over the last nine years, you know, players don't always want to come to our club or even to the Premier League. 
you know, sometimes it's a family issue, sometimes it's just a point in their career where they'd rather be somewhere else, sometimes it's a langu language issue, sometimes it's a culture issue, sometimes it's where the manager might or might not want to play them. There's so many different factors. So for us, it is a very complicated process. And, you know, sometimes it is amusing to, to read what we're supposed to be doing and not doing, um, because the reality is very often very different. And, and I can tell you that I would say 99.9% .9 of the players we've, we're linked with, we've either never heard of or never spoken to. Um, but we ultimately get judged on not bringing a player in we never even looked at. Um, it's kind of amusing for us sometimes to look at that. But the reality is, you know, we, we go through a very, very thorough process. It's very complicated. And as with every transfer window, there will always be a budget to, to work to. Graham, John, what, was it, what would you do? No, um, involved in transfers, what's your role? Is it, was that, what, do you suggest players? Or is it positions, profiles? No, so the, the clue is in the, the job title. My job is that I'm the head coach, so my responsibility is to the, the team that we have and the players that we have, and that's 20 plus players. So if then I've got a responsible to look around the world essentially for other players and recommend players, then clearly um, I'm not going to have much of a life, that's for sure, um, and not be able to do it very well is, is the other thing. So um, my job, I guess, is to, is to uh, try to put a team on the pitch that is. Uh, uh, clear in terms of what we're trying to do so that uh, the guys in the recruitment department can align what they're looking for with the team that we have so it becomes clear okay, how do we strengthen what do we need to do what we're looking for what particular attributes we're looking for what do particular people are we looking for and um, and then it's to support the, the, the club in making the, the right decision the days have gone and, and I certainly wouldn't want to be that guy that, that I'm the, the manager and I've got to decide who comes in and who goes and all that sort of stuff. It's just my job is to support the club, it's, it's to recommend, it's to help, it's to help the process to understand that recruitment, as I said earlier in my answer, recruitment sometimes sounds like it's the, the way you fix your problems and it, and it is tempting to think that but there's always a, an element of a gamble in a recruitment so the more you can do to help, the more you can do to support the more you can do to facilitate, the, the, the better the chance it is that you'll make the right decisions. Tony, time for a story. Uh, well, I'm going to disappoint you, Johnny. I'm not going to give a story, because the stories I, 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 could, uh, I, I could tell are with players who are still playing, uh, and that wouldn't be right, but maybe in 10 years' time, <laughs> okay. when they have long retired, there may be some stories to come. But in terms of the process, the recruitment, um, uh, at the football club is absolutely key, obviously, and uh, we take it extremely seriously. We have um, a, a great team who work round the clock um, 12 months of the year, looking at a huge amount of players, and, and at the end, we only buy a, a very, very few, like, like, like most clubs. And um, we, we, we feel that we've, we, over the years, we've got a lot better, um, Particularly now with, with Brexit, we can much easier get visas for for, for players uh, outside of Europe, which was very difficult in the past. Like with Percy Tao, it took quite a while for him to be able to come into uh, into our squad. Um, so, you know, I'm I, I'm really pleased with that. It's working. It's not just one person. It's a whole team working all the, yeah all, all throughout the year. And not every signing will work out. We know that. Um, but we are really careful, obviously there's so many different um, things that we need to look at, whether it's the transfer fee, salaries, how they're going to fit in, what their age is, um, and many other factors as well. And um, yeah, I'm just really pleased with the, the process that we have at the moment. Just, just a quick one on that, do, do you ever deviate from, I know it's all those different factors, wages, fee, do you ever, do you always have a picture in your mind of that's, that's the limit and we're never going to deviate from that or does it, or do you constantly reevaluate? Uh, when you say limit? In, in, in terms of a fee for a player or wages for a player or yeah, uh, uh, do you always have so, uh, sort of an idea in your mind that you're not going to go beyond that level? Yeah, I mean relative to the rest of the Premier League, you know, our, our, we, we have a structure in place for salaries and, and, and most of the clubs in the division ha have higher salaries and transfer fees, it all depends on what it is. We don't necessarily have a max because if we can get hold of one of the best young players who has so much potential, um, but typically, you know, we, we don't spend, um, we don't 
uh, spend a huge amount of transfer fees on any one player, because also that's a, it's a risk, however good the player is. Um, if something happens or they get long-term injured, then that's a huge amount of money that the, the player can't recoup at all. And so we need to spread that risk as well. Okay, well, hopefully that answers all three of the questions. I hope they. Um, thank you for those. We have another one. The troublemaker is here now. <laughs> questions and comments. So first of all, I want to say to you, Graeme, I was the lady that sat here two year years ago and said, could you make my life more exciting? I think you've done that. With the football, yeah. With the football. With the football. The football yeah. Which culminated in actually that win against Man City that night. I don't think I've been so excited for many, many years. So thank you for that. Um, and a great start to the season as well. I mean, six points in the bag, that's great. So you, you get a good tick in my box. Okay. And I think life must okay. be less stressful for you because most people lose their hair when they're stressed and you now seem to have a lot more hair than I Only have. Only here. <laughs> And I am, for you, Tony, I, I pinch myself coming here. I've spoken to somebody here, and I, every time I come here, I get goose pimples. It's a quiet night. There's, you know, we haven't got a crowd. This stadium's beautiful. It's beautiful on any day, but tonight it's lovely. So thank you for that. And also thank you for the fact that we could field an international team. You know, I've been supporting this club for many, many years. I mean, yeah, many, many, many years. Golden Ground, etc., etc. I can't believe that we have so many international players in this club. So, so thank you all for that. Um, but, <laughs> who haven't I mentioned? I'm really sorry I've got to bring this one up. Hang but... on, this isn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> they got nice fun. And, I, and we've had something about match day experience, but I'm just going to sort of put the world outside of football and think what's happening in football, um, football into our day-to-day -day life. And that is that... Most people are a bit concerned about travelling on public transport, and so lots of things are you know, being put in place for that. Um, around where we sit, there's quite a few people in East Upper that travel a long way. They travel from Dorset and all around, so you know, we're not all Sussex folk that support the Albion. Um, they're not coming because they don't want to come on the train, um, and they're not coming because they can't park. Um, because too many people aren't, you know, wanting to drive. Um, therefore, the capacity, and we're not talking about the, you know, the elephant in the room, which is sitting over there, um, which is part of the car parking here. It's just the infrastructure. And I think this is the point now we've got to that point. You know, we've, we're growing the, the crowd base, the fan base. We need to do something else about this. We've lost the one down by the university. Uh, what's happening about parking? Because it really, really does matter. I mean, my husband and I, we don't live very far away. We have to get to Mill Hill. You've got to be there two hours before, if, or maybe even longer to get here. Is there anything going to happen um, about this? Um, well, um, but first, first of all, the, the one... And again, thank you. That, that's OK. Um, <laughs> next you, year, I'm going to grow a beard, I'm going to build a stadium, <laughs> and then maybe I'll get the easy question. Um, no, I mean, first of all, you know, Brighton Hope City Council uh, don't like cars. And you've only got to look across the city to see the restrictions on parking, whether it's roadside, whether it's multi-storey, and the cost, to know that it's very difficult to park cars in this city generally. At the stadium, and in my experience, pretty much any stadium that you, you would go to in this country, it's pretty difficult to park a car. And we, when we built this stadium, had to put in place a transport plan that actually took away as much use of cars as we possibly could. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is I'm starting here 3-0 down. And you know, for, for, for me or the club generally to try and recreate infrastructure that we don't control, that we can never control, that most clubs in the world don't control, um, it is, is impossible. Um, and I suppose you know, part of me thinks, well, you know, Tottenham are currently getting 60,000 people in and out of White Hart Lane with no car parking whatsoever for general admission season ticket holders and very, very little car parking for their corporate uh, fans. And they have, you know, the same kind of issues as us, but, but they have to manage them. And they've got fans coming in literally from every part of the country, every single home game. So, you know, I've got a huge amount of sympathy, particularly in the COVID environment. And of all the times that we could lose Bennett's field because Mr. Bennett wants to develop his land and that's his right, um, you know, this is the worst possible time to have our car parking uh, capacity restricted. But, but can I wave a magic wand and change that? I can't. And we will continue to look for options and we'll continue to do our best to, to try and make it as easy as possible to get to and from the stadium. But it is very, very difficult. 
okay, going to be just, unpopular next year now as well, aren't they? <laughs> um, just stay with you, Paul, if we can. Mark, who's now been found in Worcester, emailed to say, can the club reconsider the level of conditions attached to season ticket sharing? I, I have had quite a few different emails, and they're all slightly different, so apologies to those people who've emailed. I can't go to sure. every single example. Yeah. He understands that there's a one-off fee. That's understandable. But why uh, do non-season ticket holders have to sign up to my Albion membership? And why can't they be shared easily between uh, different generations and groups of families and friends? For example, a 65 plus or an under 21 can't be shared with a full paying adult. Yeah, I mean, for, first of all, you know, this is, a, this is a topic that's obviously, you know, quite dear to a lot of people's hearts. And let's start at the beginning. Our terms and conditions and the law don't allow tickets to be passed between people, whether it's for money or for free. We all know that it happens and has happened for generations. And generally speaking, it, it works until it doesn't. So it, and when it doesn't work, it usually goes horribly wrong because you'll end up with a band fan sitting next to you or an away supporter or someone touts their ticket and we've got anyone in the stadium or there's an altercation and the season ticket holders lent their ticket ends up losing their ticket because someone has let them down with their behavior. So unofficial ticket sharing works until it doesn't. In a COVID environment, we had no choice. We had to move to digital ticketing and unless people were prepared to give each other their phones, digital ticketing, ticketing was never, never gonna be a, a, an issue for us. And we also knew that there were gonna be a lot of people in the COVID environment, older people, more vulnerable people, that probably would wanna limit the number of games they attended, either until they felt comfortable, until they were double vaccinated, until their family were double vaccinated and a whole range of different things. So we had a choice. We, we could either leave the digital tickets on people's phones and literally have no kind of ticket transfer other than the season ticket uh, exchange system, or we could come up with a system that we felt gave people the maximum amount of flexibility within the law, within our terms and conditions, and within an environment where we're required to know in a COVID environment who is in our stadium at any one time, in case there's a mass outbreak. And if we get that wrong, the sanctions for the club and for all of you reduce capacity. So if we want to take those kind of risks and run the risk of there being an outbreak, which then leaves the local authority to restrict our capacity, it probably means a third or a half of the people in this room won't be coming to games anyway. And we want to avoid that. We want to avoid that as much as we could. So we consulted with supporters. We came up with a, a scheme. The ticketing team came up with a scheme which basically enabled you as season ticket holders for £20 to share your ticket with as many people as you wanted, as often as you wanted, no limitations, apart from the people receiving the tickets being club members. Now, we don't think that's unreasonable. Why should someone who hasn't invested in the club get a ticket over someone that has? Why should club members be disadvantaged over people that may or may not support the club? That doesn't seem very fair. And equally, how can we capture the data and begin to engage people if we don't know who's in our stadium? So we came up with a scheme that we felt was perfectly reasonable. Thousands of fans have already signed up to it. It's working really well. We've invested in the technology to support it. This season, it's a trial. It may or may not be continued beyond this, this period, but it works and it's fair and it's reasonable. Now, except for, for one-off uh, exchanges, it might seem expensive to people, but if you look at it a different way, if the person who wanted to come for that one-off game was buying a match ticket, they'd spend more than 25 or 28 pounds. And if the season ticket holder is generous enough not to charge them anything, that's probably the cheapest way to watch a Premier League game in the country. So, you know, it seems to us to be a balanced scheme that's fair. It ticks all of the boxes. It gives us the best chance of keeping the stadium open with the full capacity for as long as possible. And most importantly, if we were unfortunate enough to have some kind of outbreak, it keeps all of you as safe as we can possibly keep you. Um, and for me, those balance of things are really important. I'm just going to ask one more on, on ticketing, Paul, just because we've had quite a few, and this is from overseas season ticket holders. So if you could just deal with this one. Again, not everyone's situation is slightly different, but here's just one example uh, from Noel. Government recognising the EU-wide COVID passport. You can get into the UK. Why can't you get into the Amex? Are there any assurances that the overseas season ticket holders will still be able to um, visit the Amex. I think that might be applied to parts of Ireland as well. Yeah. Um, 
just quickly. Yeah, well, first of all, they're, they're not our rules, the government's rules. So whilst you can come into the country on a, on a COVID uh, passport from the EU to attend a mass spectator event, it, it's different. And, you know, at the moment, we're hoping the government gives us more flexibility to make sure that we, can't, we don't just have to accept COVID passes or negative lateral flow tests, that we'll be able to accept EU passes as well. But again, we're not, we're not making these rules up as we go along. Um, we're, we're, we're following government guidelines and we're following Premier League mandates. And I think as a general point, you know, Jenny Gower, who's in this room and her team in support of services, you know, they don't sit in a dark room thinking, how can we make it as difficult as possible for Brighton Over Albion supporters to come to the stadium? You know, we're, we're trying all the time to make it as easy as possible for you to come, but at the same time to keep you as safe as possible. And those two things sometimes are not easily reconciled. Okay, well, I think that hopefully does everything on the, on the tickets. I know there may be other ones that we can come back to. We've only got 25 more minutes left here on BBC Radio Sussex. Um, so, um, crack on. Um, you've got another question. No, it's just, a, I, I wondered if you could answer something, but I've, it's always a quiz to me. It's how do they estimate how many people are actually in the stadium? You know, so sometimes they say it's 27,500, but actually you look around and you think, not quite sure. So, and, and when you're saying you know every single person that comes through now, the accuracy of that, and I will also go back, and, and you know, for, for Graham and the boys, and I hate to go back on a point that I've already made, but I'm going to. Um, if you have to leave early because you've got to go get somewhere, we don't give you a cheer, we don't give you the credit. And I just want to, I, I come away sometimes because we have to make the dash. Um, and people are streaming out the game. And what I want to do is thank you and the boys for a fantastic game. And we don't get a chance to do that. So, so can I say thank you, Graham, tonight and the boys for all those times I rush off about five minutes, you know, like everybody else. But, but well, how do you count the number? We, we always announce, like, pretty much every club in the country, the sold attendance because they're the tickets we've sold for the game. Um, in terms of who comes, that's obviously down to you guys. Okay, okay. Um, if, you, if you don't come, and every club in the country will have no-shows, um, and most clubs in the country will have their highest level of no-shows at this time of year, for lots of different reasons. And of course, I'm, with COVID on top of that, you've, you've got even more issues. In terms of who we know is in the stadium, well, that's down to your honesty. Because if, if you've actually come into the stadium with your season ticket on your phone and not given your phone to somebody else, then we know it's you. If you've given your phone to somebody else who you haven't transferred the season ticket to officially, then we don't know it's you. So, you know, we're, we're relying on your honesty. Okay. Yeah, okay. We don't want it to end in a conversation. That's the only because I know there's the one gentleman here, you've definitely got a question. You told me you've got a question. So we've only got 20 minutes or so. So you want to get up and ask your question. This lady, you, you said to me you had a question. I have a question, yes. I don't know which panel member to put it to, so I leave that to you. Um, my name is Maria. Um, I'm a new season ticket holder, joining my husband, who's been a season ticket holder for quite a few years. Um, <clears throat> we've talked about the recruitment and so forth of players, and I just want to um, shine a bit of a light on the academy, which seems a fantastic facility and a lot of effort goes into the development of young players. And I just wonder what advice or guidance do you give these young players in respect to selecting an agent and working with an agent? So I'm not thinking specific people, I'm thinking more principles, if you're with me. I mean, when the players are in the academy, we, we run a number of different seminars for them that will cover lots of different things. And, and representation is, is one of those things. And, you know, like every walk of life, there are good agents and there are not so good agents. And, you know, what we try and do is, is, is talk about what an agent can do for you and what they shouldn't do for you. And then ultimately we have to leave it to the players and their parents and when they're at a young age. And what you find increasingly is, is the, the more talented the player, the younger they have an agent alongside them, literally. And so very often, by the time we're running these seminars, some of these young lads have had agents or representation, shall we say, because technically, you know, there are limitations on when someone can represent a young player for quite some time, and the parents will be the ones being guided. But we try and educate them on all kinds of things that are non-football related. So it, it could be anything from the use of social media, um, it could be um, going out and making sure that they're not in the wrong places at the wrong time with the wrong people. And we, what we're trying to do in the academy is give them an all-round education 
that ultimately leads them to a career in professional football, ideally. But if it doesn't, it gives them the life skills to go off and, and get a job like everyone else and, and live their lives in a, in a good way. When it gets to the level that, that Graham's working at, you know, those players have long since, uh, long since had their agents alongside them and, and you know, they are the people that very often we're interfacing with when we're trying to get new contracts done or, or bring new players in. And Graham, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, hopefully no, no agents listening to this, but um, <laughs> I'm lucky that I don't generally speak to them that much because I speak to the players and my, my relationship is with them. And you always have to be respectful that there's people working for them, their agents that represent them, and that's fine, absolutely. But my relationship is on a football level, so I'm fortunate that I don't get involved in the, the finances or anything else like that. I, I try and help them to, like, as Paul said, to to understand about themselves, to understand about what they want from their lives, and then uh, understand that whoever represents them, represents them. So choose, choose well. And if, they've, if they want to speak, if they want to ask any questions, then of course I'm always here, but it is their choice, it is their right to ch choose whoever they want. Um, there's a lot of good, good guys out there, like Paul said, but there's, like in any industry, there's some not so good, but when that's the case, you just got to try and help the player. Lovely, great question. Um, Tony, just before, if you want to make your way up to the mic, if you've got any, another question, I just want to say, great start to the WSL season this weekend, um, and the new facilities are opening up, I think, next month officially. Um, how excited are you about all that work that's been done and, and everything that's been put into that? Yeah, the new facility is absolutely amazing. It's, um, I, I believe the women train there today for the first time, and uh, I was here at the Amex on Sunday, and we, we played really well. Uh, to get a 2 0 win, it's a great start to the season. Um, again, like the Premier League, the WSL is really competitive and, and particularly you know, competing against the top four teams. The gap in the women's game is, is, is bigger than the, the men's game, so um, you know, it's really tough for us. We've got ambitions to, uh, to compete for the top four, um, which is, is highly ambitious, but it's great to have um, such a target. And um, I wish hope and and all the players, the best of luck for the rest of the season. Thank you. Another question from the floor. Thank you. I'm David. I live in Hove. I'm a season ticket holder at Lower Stand, uh, Lower West Stand. Your, recent, your last comments have stolen some of my thunder because I wanted to ask about the women's game. And I'm afraid I'm not prepared to travel to Crawley but I am prepared to travel to the Amex, and I'd like to see more of the uh, women's matches played here at the Amex. Is that likely, Paul? I mean, I know sure, some, no. some clubs this season have adopted more games in their main stadium, haven't they? Right they across have. The WSL. Um, we, we, first of all, we would love to have the women's team playing back, back in Brighton. It's difficult to fit every game into this stadium all of the time because the, the demands on the pitcher are already quite significant and obviously in the world that we're in at the moment it's the men's first team that generates a significant income that helps us to run the club and, and to sustain women's football in our academy so we have to prioritize the men's first team in terms of the use of the pitch that said we want to build the women's game and play our part in that and therefore we are looking all the way through the fixture calendar for opportunities to bring hope's team here and we'll keep doing that we know that crawley isn't ideal um, you know, it's far from ideal in, in lots of ways. Um, and, you know, if we, can, if we can get more matches here, we will. But it, this is an expensive stadium to open. And so when we open it and we've got two, two and a half thousand fans in here, it, it's not a cheap exercise on top of already a very expensive uh, commitment to the women's game. Hope understands that. We're very open with Hope Power and her, her team about, you know, how many times we think we can, we can get them into this stadium. Um, but where we can, we will. And more importantly, or as importantly, if there are other opportunities to get them back to the city, then we'll look, for, look, for, look at those as well. I think cricket is showing the way here. Uh, women's cricket is b becoming more and more popular, getting huge crowds, uh, sp particularly for international cricket. And uh, perhaps uh, that will show us the way. I think women's tennis, women's golf, I mean, they've all done it before. And, um, you know, they've built up their own audiences as well as, as, well as being part, an integral part of, of the men's games as well. So, um, yeah, we, we certainly have a massive commitment. As Tony said, we, we've just invested over £8 million in a, 
in a headquarters building for the, for the women's team and the girls' operation at the training ground. We're committing ever more each year to salaries and, and staff for that area. And the whole setup is becoming more and more professional. So you're on the right track, David. We'll keep going with it. Lovely. And of course, we've got the Women's Euros coming up, of course, next we, year, we where uh, the Amex Stadium is, uh, is hosting some games as well. So I think those tickets have actually gone on, on sale quite recently, actually, the Correct. first batch anyway. So another question. Hello, my name's Louise. I'm from Hastings, but I'm really from the North Stand. And my question is specifically about the North Stand. Um, and I think I'm speaking for quite a few fans from there. Um, recently, I, I saw that the Amex had topped a poll of the best atmosphere for any football ground in Europe. And I think it came seventh overall for the best football ground. So doing something really well. So <laughs> and it's certainly very exciting coming here. Um, I was wondering, and obviously not at the moment because of COVID, uh, if you had any plans at all, if it had ever crossed your minds to introduce safe standing in the North Stand because there is a big call for it. Uh. Thanks, Louise, for that. Uh, the answer, simple answer is yes. Um, and I think it was probably about just under three years ago, we, we had an evening here where we invited as many supporters who wanted to come to talk about safe standing to come. Um, I think about three did. Um, actually, I'm exaggerating. It was probably 33. But, but the, the, the real issue was there was not as much support for it as we'd expected. And we surveyed fans as well. And again, it's always an issue because the, I think the common misconception with safe standing is that it's going to allow people to stand where they want. It's going to allow people to bunch up in groups. And the reality is it, it's not any of those things. And it's one person to effectively uh, a, a space that is actually bigger than a seat. So instead of increasing the capacity, it's more likely to reduce it. And the challenge for me, Louise, is that I would have to go to the man at the end of this table and say, you built a beautiful stadium as you described it, and as the lady over there described it, now I want to take it apart, I want to reduce the capacity, it's going to cost you more, and the fans who want it expect it to cost them less. It's not a great combination. Um, and, you know, we, we've always had an open mind, but unfortunately the demand hasn't actually met the open mind. And if that changes, and if there is a very significant majority of people in one area that want it, um, then of course we'll look at it, and of course we'll look at all of the economics that go with it. But it's not, it's not quite as overwhelming demand as, as you, you might think, based on what we've done so far. Graham, we can just bring you in. Um, how are you finding life in Sussex? I know it's been a difficult 18 months, uh, particularly with what's been going on, but how are you finding life here? Have you had a chance to explore and you know, how comfortable do you feel on the south coast? Oh, I'm really happy. Um, it, it has been a really tough uh, two and a bit years, I think it is, uh, in terms of just managing a Premier League group and a club. It's a fantastic responsibility, of course, but it comes with its challenges. Um, I didn't foresee a global pandemic and, um, yeah, personally it's been quite tough in terms of uh, losing my parents, but in terms of how everybody's been to me, you know, people I've been to in the street, it's, they're so supportive, so friendly, um, great club with, with really good people. Um, uh, in terms of relaxation, I have a little walk on Devil's Dyke and uh, realise I'm getting old very, very quickly. Uh, any dogs to take with you? Any? Dogs to take with you? No? Yes. Yeah, yeah we've got a little, we've got a little uh, King Charles Spaniel, so she's, she's, um, she's enjoying that. No, but it's, we're, we're really happy. It's a fantastic part of the world and um, we're very, very lucky to be here. Lovely. Another question from the floor. Hi, my name's Nick. I'm in the West Side of Lower. Um, it's, it's sort of a couple of questions really, both around the, the transfer side of things. One of them is, um, personally as a fan, I was a bit surprised to, excuse the pronunciation, Mikhail Kabovnik going off to Olympiakos. I wondered if that was an illustration of the success of our recruitment and as much as I understood it, he's got a, a guaranteed option to buy at the other end of that. So is that successful or is it less so because I think we saw him as being a good prospect that we'd fought off a lot of other clubs to actually acquire the guy? Um, the other one was addressed to Paul. Um, if I remember rightly, I, I believe you at one stage in your lengthy career worked at um, Vancouver, Vancouver Whitecaps. 
Um, and I read an article in a well-known online football magazine that um, there's a lot of growth in Canada. And I just was curious to know if you still had any links there that might be beneficial to the club, if there's anything going on in that direction. Sure. Do you want to start with that one first, Paul? So and then we'll come back to the um, thing. Yeah, we still, still talk regularly to, to the guys in, in Vancouver. Obviously, they've had success in, in developing players themselves and, and selling them into Europe. We've had one or two players come over from Vancouver to uh, train with us and before Graham's time actually made a couple of appearances in the first team in, in, in a cup game. Um, MLS is, is, is getting bigger and bigger. There's still a gap in terms of the standard of, of, of some players at the top level of MLS and, and, and the rest. Um, but I think you'll see more and more players emerging from that part of the world. And as Tony said earlier, with Brexit now uh, done, our ability to bring in players from other parts of the world is a bit easier, bizarrely. And you know, that gives us the option to look at the North American market as well. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's, a long, it's going to be a long, slow burn. But there's a, a, a World Cup coming up in that part of the world. And what you usually see is an, an, an even bigger spurt in growth following a World Cup over there, which is what got MLS going in the first place back in 1994. I'm sure the stateside seagulls will be looking for a pre-season tour out there very soon. We, well, we, we know, did. We, we have discussed that before. Again, we, we would love to because you know we've got a big commitment to American Express, as you as you all know, and they've got an even bigger commitment to us. And we're very keen to to get to the U.S. and, and play some games. But in the at the moment, you know, we're delighted to get out of Brighton to play some games. <laughs> it's difficult enough, but um, but yeah, in the future for sure. The Mikhail Karbovnik one, Graham, do you want to just start on that one? Again, it's another, it's another example of how uh, recruitment is so complex because um, you always have to remember that a football club's main thing is not to be successful in recruitment, although that's, you want that to happen. The main thing is the team on the pitch is doing well and the team's improving. Successful recruitment will help that, of course. And then it's, you've got the balance between you need a squad of players, 20 plus, only 11 play, um, and how do you improve your players? Mostly it's by playing. So there's a balance between, okay, what's the right thing for the player in terms of how do they improve? How do they get to the, you know, reach their full potential? Because most of our policies around, we're not signing Harry Kane, we're not signing Lukaku, we're signing players that haven't quite got to this level and we're trying to get them up to that level. And there are different ways to do that in terms of working with us all the time or maybe using a loan path or like so, so Ben White, for example, that there's a, there's a combination of doing the two and then, you know, all the time you're making those decisions based on the players also got needs as well in terms of what, what he feels like is the right thing. So um, sometimes you can't really assess whether it's been successful or not until, you know, 10, 15 years time, then you can take a bigger picture look and say, okay, that was a good, that was a good bit of business or that was a successful strategy. Um, but it's a very complex process, that's for sure. Okay, seven minutes to go here on BBC Radio Sussex. We might enter the quickfire round now if we can, because um, if you want to get through, if you've got a question, you can just queue up if you want. So you have to fire through. We go on. Okay, just a quick one. Um, I'm Tim from Felmer. I've been a season ticket holder since 1979, and to date, I haven't got my season ticket. I'm no good on a mobile phone. I got the email, downloaded the ticket for the Watford match but I didn't have Google Pay or whatever you're supposed to have. My son downloaded Google Pay for me when he was down here from London and it wouldn't accept the ticket. So I've been on to supportive services. Everyone I've spoken to when you've waited for 15 minutes have been absolutely brilliant. But I still haven't got my season ticket. And I was sitting at the cricket at Hove yesterday and a chap who's sort of my era said, oh, I've got a plastic one. And I wish you had offered me a plastic one with my picture. I mean, I have revealed it this afternoon, but it's so frustrating for people of my era who aren't very good on the mobile phone. And literally, I went to Gillingham and it was much easier to get into than was here. You know, and Well, two I, things. I, First of all, everything. you don't want to go you're, back you're to Gillingham. You're doing Gillingham. yourself down. No, you, look, you, you look much younger than you're giving the impression for. <laughs> and it's your lucky night because Jenny Gower, just, my head of supporter services, who is an expert in this area, is sitting at the back. She's even probably got a pocket full of photocards and all of that sort of yeah. stuff. Okay. I know a couple of people have emailed as well with individual questions about tickets and seating as well, so we will forward those to the club if that's all right, um, because they're very specific. So I don't want to be... Yeah, no, no, there's a gentleman just behind you who hasn't asked a question just yet, so maybe if he goes first, and then if that's all right... Then... Hi there, um, I'm Matthew from Jeffington. I'm a season ticket holder in the West Lower. My question is, um, I acknowledge all your wonderful work with the, acad the Academy and all the facilities, but going forward in years to come, are there any targets to develop homegrown talent from here in Sussex? 
and have a number of Sussex-born players uh, in the squad, like the names of Duncan, Solly, um, or will that just be a nicety going forwards? Well, again, we, we, we're recruiting as many local players as we can. We've got great links with schools, with colleges. We've got scouting networks looking at the local district leagues. And, you know, where the talent exists, trust me, we'll, we'll bring it in. And, you know, one of the challenges of Sussex, as, as we all know, as beautiful county as it is, as, as Graham said, you know, we, we've got a lot of fields. We've got a lot of fish to the south and our catchment area is, is not as rich with people as, as some clubs have it, particularly the London clubs. So our scouting now is getting further and further afield. We go north towards London, we go west, we go east. Um, but if we can bring in more Sussex lads and girls for the, for the women's setup, great. We, we will always look to do that. Brilliant. OK. Sorry, did you want to go on? Yeah, go on quickly. And then we've got three minutes to go. Yeah, quick question for Graham. Um, what are you putting in Shane Duffy's tea? Because he's just magnificent this season. Um, Lamptey as well, where are we? Is he, is he, mm. is he coming back? Um, and players on the periphery, you know, Jürgen Ricardo, there's talk of him possibly fitting into a role. So, mm. football question for you. There you go. Three questions, three minutes. Shane um, has just had a, a, a terrible experience last year, I would say, in terms of what he'd had to deal with off the pitch, uh, a loan move that, that didn't go well for him at all. And like anything, like I said earlier, uh, sometimes you evaluate, you make decisions, you learn, you improve, and he's taken stock of his life and where he wants to go, and he's come back from his Sloan experience in a, a really, really good way, uh, uh, almost like a different guy. And I think you can see that on, on the pitch, uh, and it's fantastic to see because, uh, yeah, it really is. Um, so uh, that's really good news. Tarek played yesterday in an internal game, sort of 20 minutes, 11 v 11. So that was really, really positive. He's taken some, some big steps recently. So we're hopeful that we can maybe work towards, um, I'd like, I'm reluctant to put timescales, but maybe Swansea in the Carabao Cup, some involvement there, if things go well. Um, so he's getting close and that's really, really good, good for us, of course. He's, he's had an incredibly frustrating time. Um, and Jürgen's back from, from his loan um, and just basically reintroducing into the group and into the, into the, into the squad and, and he's obviously got an opportunity to show what, 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 he's, what he can do. He's, he's got talent, he's got, he's got ability. Things haven't worked out quite how he would like since he's been here but um, you know, he's got to just knuckle down and show what he can do because there's a, there's a player there. Okay, any final questions? Go on, you were the first here. You were the first person to arrive tonight, so you get the last question. Go I'll on. do a quick one. Uh, what's your opinion on XG? <laughs> <laughs> well, we could extend for another hour well, on XG, long, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been talked about a lot with relation to the Albion, hasn't it, Graham? It has, yeah. I mean, um, in some ways, it's, 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 you know, they always used to say football's a results game, so it became quite binary. If you weren't, you were good, and if you lost, you were rubbish. That's how it was. So now you've got XG to get you out of jail a little bit, you know? You can still, loot, you can still be rubbish, but on XG you've done okay. So depends how you see it. I mean, it's just a, it's a, and seriously, it's just a, it's a, a way to analyze performance. It's a way to look at performance, but we all know the most important thing is the result, but it gives you at least a chance to say, okay, maybe, maybe we, 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 we're on the, the right path sometimes or the wrong path sometimes, because sometimes you can win and you can play badly. Well, the past been pretty good so far this season and the journey, of course, continues at the weekend. Uh, thanks very much to everybody who's attended this evening and uh, the wide variety of questions, of course, as well. Um, they've been really, really good. And, of course, you can watch again uh, if you're just tuning into us a little bit later. I know some people have got plans to watch the football. Uh, so you can catch that on My Albion uh, TV as well as on BBC Sounds as well. Our coverage on BBC Radio Sussex continues, of course, on Saturday ahead of the trip to uh, Brentford. But I think it just leaves me one final thing, and that's uh, for everyone to just give... A very big thank you and a warm round of applause for our panel tonight. Um, thanks for coming and thanks to the panel as well. Owner and Chairman, Tony Bloom. <laughs> Chief Executive, Paul Barber. And of course, the Seagulls head coach, Graham Potter. Thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. We'll see you next time at the Albion. Good night.